exactly true. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to the um, Midwest um, Comparative Effectiveness Public Advisory Committee, sponsored and and through the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. This is. Um, our third meeting uh, of the Midwest CPAC. And we appreciate um, the presence of uh, our, uh, our group as well as all of, the, all of the folks in the audience here. We're looking forward to a great day. My name is Dr. Donald Casey. I'm the chair of the Midwest CPAC. And um, as we always do in these, in these public meetings, um, we're going to start by asking each member of the um, council to introduce themselves and also disclose or declare any conflicts of interest um, relative to today's discussion around atopic dermatitis. Um, so I'll begin. Um, I am uh, Don Casey. I work for a company called Med Decision, um, which is a population health management company. I uh, do not have any uh, conflicts of interest relative to this topic today. Shumi? My name is Shumi Yun. I'm a chronic disease epidemiologist for the Missouri Department of Health and the Senior Services. I'm also an adjunct faculty with the University of Missouri, Columbia. Oh, no conflict of interest. I'm Harold Pollack. I'm a professor at the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, and uh, uh, and I have no conflicts to uh, to report. I'm Mary Clicks, Dr. Mary Clicks, um, medical oncologist, assistant professor at St. Louis University, and I have no conflicts. I'm Scott Misek, clinical pharmacist at Barnes Jewish Hospital and associate professor at the St. Louis College of Pharmacy. I have no conflicts of interest. My name is Jill Johnson, and I am a professor at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences College of Pharmacy, and I have no conflicts. My name is uh, Dr. Eric Garnbrick. I'm a 
Associate Professor in the Center for Health Outcomes Research at St. Louis University. I have no conflicts of interest. I'm Rachel Sachs. I'm an Associate Professor of Law at Washington University in St. Louis, and I have no conflicts to declare. It's on, right? It's at our, oh, sorry, I don't have to turn it on. Uh, Ryan Barker, I'm the Vice President of Health Policy with the Missouri Foundation for Health, and I have no conflicts. Uh, Dr. Ray Mustafa, I'm um, an Associate Professor of Medicine and Nephrology in the University of Kansas Medical Center, and I'm the Director of Outcomes and Implementation Research, and I have no conflicts of interest. Bill Moore with the REACH Healthcare Foundation in Kansas City, and I have no conflicts of interest. Thank you. And as we always do, we have over to this side two of our clinical experts and our patients. And I'd like um, first the two clinical experts to introduce themselves and disclose any conflicts, and the same thing with our patients. I'm Elaine Siegfried. I'm a professor of pediatrics and dermatology at St. Louis University. Uh, I'm a pediatric dermatologist, and I served as principal investigator for both the Anacor trials and, the, and also the upcoming pediatric trials for um, Regeneron. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Silverberg uh, at Northwestern University, and uh, I was an investigator in phase two and phase three trials for Dupilumab, as well as a consultant for both Pfizer and for Regeneron. My name is Debbie Burns, and I'm a patient that was in the clinical trial for Dupixent. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And my name is Meg Duguid, and I am, I am also a patient, but I was not in the clinical trial. I'm well controlled on um, topical steroids, and I'm one of Dr. Silverberg's patients as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with that, what I'll do is ask um, our uh, our leader of ICER, Dr. <coughs> Steve Pearson, to come to the podium and present the overview of the day. Let's kick off. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, thanks for being here. Uh, good. So, um, again, this is a way of formality to, to reintroduce the Midwest um, CPAC and, and ICER. CPAC is an independent group that we convene to debate, deliberate upon the evidence that's supplied by the ICER report, which itself hopes to be deeply infused with the perspectives and input of a variety of stakeholders, patients, clinical experts, manufacturers, and payers. Um, the CPAC's job is to serve as an independent uh, venue in which we can have a debate about the evidence on both effectiveness and value, uh, again, with another opportunity for stakeholders to contribute to the discussion and I'll talk about the agenda later and about how this feeds into a discussion of not only how we judge evidence, but how we can think about working together to apply that evidence in the policy realm and to the practice realm to improve the outcomes for patients and to help provide a more sustainable healthcare system. ICER itself, which serves as, in a sense, the academic uh, backbone to this, I wanted to give a backdrop on, or back uh, ground on our conflicts of interest, if you will. Our funding comes from a variety of sources. The biggest part in 2017, approximately 78% is from nonprofit foundations. Chief among them are the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, the California Healthcare Foundation, and the Blue Shield of California Foundation. That's the, the funding that we use for the reports that come through the CPAC. We also have a separate policy summit program in which we bring together leaders from the drug innovator community and from pharmacy benefit managers and health insurers. And for that, we receive contributions from uh, those entities that account for, as you can see, about 20% of our annual revenue. And we still have a small remaining uh, government contract that contributes to our work as well. Why are we having this meeting today and why this topic? Well, as usual, we've picked a topic in, in which we sense that there's a great opportunity for innovation to help patients. And that's not unique, obviously, to atopic dermatitis, but we sense that this, one of the reasons that, this, um, that the drugs that we're looking at today were, were recommended and chosen was because of the substantial benefit that can be brought to patients in this area and their families. A quote from the International Eczema Council kind of makes it clear that 
For atopic dermatitis, its symptoms and extensive comorbidities result in a tremendous burden on patients and society in terms of quality of life, social, academic, and many other consequences. The physical aspects of the disease include not only itching and scratching, but also sleep, pain, bleeding, and dietary limitations. Patients with atopic dermatitis suffer from tremendous emotional consequences such as behavioral problems, irritability, crying, and social isolation. So obviously atopic dermatitis has a very broad spectrum, and we'll hear about that. We'll hear from patients, we'll hear from clinical experts and others, but it's quite clear that it can have a very important impact on patients and on families and on broader society. The other reason we're here in that context is also because of the concern about increasing health care budgets, because that also affects everybody, from patients to families, also the broader health care system, and even state and federal budgets. Now, we all know that atopic dermatitis is a common condition. The National Eczema Association uh, said yesterday, I'm sure this has been out, you know, their, their, their data suggests that over 18 million Americans have atopic dermatitis. It's a very common condition. Now, with drugs that offer a new mechanism of action, that often stimulates a lot of questions about you know, the appropriate use. Which patients should use these drugs? At what price does that kind of make sense with the benefit that patients and others are receiving? And how do health systems manage the cost, both in the short and the long term? Linked to that is some concern that in our current health system, often patients can have difficulty accessing new drugs. Um, insurers sometimes use step therapy protocols where patients have to use earlier drugs first. Um, they may be required sometimes to switch drugs in some way when they change insurance. And a constant concern about high out-of-pocket costs and how that affects patients and their families and also their ability to continue to take the, the medication and other treatments that they need. So as usual, we're here facing that tension between innovation, the opportunity to help patients, and the broader questions about costs and value across the healthcare system. <coughs> and therefore, we hope that by looking objectively and with you all in as transparent a fashion as we can at the evidence and by having a public discussion about it, one that does not shy away from talking about real issues of trade-offs and of value and of how to achieve the best outcomes we can in a responsible fashion, that that discussion is a critical part of what our health system needs in order for patients to do well both now and in the future. So I want to thank you for coming and being part of this. Many of you in the audience have already contributed substantively to the, the work we've done on this report, and it's really a pleasure to have you here. So the background of how we talk about value in this meeting, um, I wanted to show you. It's kind of a conceptual picture. Um, as I've stated, the goal that I hope we all share, certainly, is that we want to achieve sustainable access to high-value care for all patients. And our reports are structured so that we, in a sense, view this as requiring a view of two different views of ways to achieve that goal. One is to consider the long-term value for money of different care options, thinking as long-term as we can. The other is to wonder whether there is or is not any concern about shorter term affordability. Within the long term value for money, our reports are structured to have sections that really focus in on comparative clinical effectiveness, on incremental cost effectiveness, and we also recognize that there are important considerations that might fall outside of those usual boxes, if you will, but very important ones, and we label these other benefits or disadvantages. These are things that, again, could be benefits to patients themselves or to their families or to society that aren't well captured by the clinical evidence or by the attempt to model out the incremental cost effectiveness. And we all know that every healthcare situation happens in a context. The context is how severe is the disease? Have there been adequate treatments for this before? Are there special aspects of uncertainty or of broader ethical and social factors that we need to consider? So we try to make sure that we bring all of this broader view as we think about long-term value for money, and when the CPAC votes on value later, it will be this broader set of considerations that we want them to, take into, into, to have in their mind. For short-term affordability, we provide um, estimates of the potential budget impact, and we allow 
folks to think about what different prices and uptake would mean and whether that might, again, even if we have good long-term value for money, whether we might need to work together to consider how short-term affordability may need to be managed in a particular way. So that's the structure of the report and to some extent the structure of the discussion that we'll have today. Following this uh, brief opening, uh, Dr. David Rind will present a summary of the evidence on comparative clinical effectiveness, the other benefits and other issues, and then the comparative value component will be presented by Dr. Marita Zimmerman, who's with the University of Washington modeling group with whom ICER has a, a longstanding relationship. At around 11.30, we will shift to having a specific opportunity for manufacturers to provide comment and for them to engage in discussion with the CPAC and the ICER research team. Following that, there will be an opportunity for public comments and discussion similarly. And my guess is that we'll be running ahead of schedule um, and we'll probably be able to break for lunch a little bit early. But technically right now, 12.30 is the target. I want to break early because 30 minutes is never enough time for lunch and we'll hopefully have longer before we come back to begin the formal deliberation again with the council that will have the opportunity to further digest and discuss the evidence before they take votes on the evidence and value. Then we'll shift to the policy roundtable and a final round of reflections and wrap up and we should again be done, my hope is before four o'clock for the folks who need to get out to O'Hare. All right, with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Rin to come up, and uh, the gavel and the moderating returns to you, Dr. Casey. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> thank you. Let me just, uh, I have a laser pointer, great. And I have a button, let me see. The green one, the big green one. The big green one. Ah, oh, got it. There's a huge green one there, which of course I wasn't noticing because it was so big and green. Um, I have no disclosures of uh, conflicts of interest relevant to uh, this report. And uh, key members of our team include uh, Maggie Webb, who's here, Shan Shan Liu, and Noah Mwanda. Um, atopic dermatitis is a chronic, chronically relapsing skin condition. It's characterized by itching and dry skin. Um, it's very common. There's a wide spectrum of disease. It affects about 11% of children, 3 to 7% of adults in the United States. I'm a primary care doctor. I see people with very mild atopic dermatitis all the time. But again, there's this very large spectrum, and you're going to hear about that from patients with extremely mild disease to extremely severe disease. Um, the majority of patients, though, are adequately managed with topical therapies. You're going to be hearing the terms mild to moderate and moderate to severe, moderate, severe, all sorts of those. It's important to know that there are no agreed on definitions that everybody would say, this is what we all mean when we're using those terms. This is, I'm going to show you a couple of photos here, three. This photo and the next one are showing you presumably localized disease on a limb and back of the knee that by some scales, because they look really at individual lesion areas, might call this severe. And other scales, because they assess how the disease is on lots of different parts of the body, might call this moderate. Here's another patient with less severe disease in each location, but widespread disease. And so those scales might flip about which one of these they would call moderate and which they might call severe. So just to know that there's that spectrum and also so you get a sense of the kind of disease we're talking about that's making the patients as miserable as you're going to hear about. The effect of atopic dermatitis on patients' lives can be profound. Um, that came through over and over again as we spoke with people. Uh, there can be intolerable itching. There can be pain from these lesions. Sleep can be horribly disrupted for many patients. Patients have higher rates of depression and anxiety. There are higher rates of suicidal ideation in people with atopic dermatitis. The disease can affect intimacy. You can have lesions on the face. You can have lesions on the genitals and the breasts. <coughs> 
it can affect family dynamics um, in sick roles and caregiver roles. Children can get bullied. Uh, the disease can affect school and work attendance. There's this concept of presenteeism, of sort of the opposite of absenteeism, presenteeism, showing up for work, but not being healthy enough to really do your full job because you're not feeling well. There can be disability for certain professions. You can imagine many health professions that require the wearing of gloves that patients could be disabled for, but many other professions as well. Um, it has effects on diet, on choices for exercise, willingness to go and swim, for instance, recreation. There can be heavy burdens of treatment. Uh, people can spend hours a day applying therapies, and this itself can create burdens for families and caregivers, including through applying those therapies, but also through lost sleep, if a family member isn't sleeping, and through missed work. Management of the disease typically starts with meticulous skin care, using moisturizers, emollients, topical corticosteroids and topical calcineurin inhibitors can be used if needed. And again, this is management prior to the drugs we're talking about today. Uh, when that's not responding adequately with topical therapy, options include phototherapy, systemic immunomodulators, none of which has previously been FDA approved for this indication, and prednisone, which can be used in short courses but has many problems in terms of rebound and many guidelines recommend against using. These therapies have harms or potential harms. Topical corticosteroids can cause skin changes. They can cause thinning of the skin and many other skin changes. More are potent topical corticosteroids or when used on particularly thin skin or over wide areas for a long time can be systemically absorbed and cause adrenal suppression. Uh, but overall, one of the things we heard from everyone, patients, the, group, the expert clinicians, the eczema groups, is that there's this concept of steroid phobia that also shows up in the literature that people may be more worried about topical steroids than they deserve. And so not only do they have real harms, but also they're often underused because people are scared of them. The topical calcineurin inhibitors um, cause some degree of stinging, some maybe one of them worse than the other. Uh, there's also a black box warning on the topical calcineurin inhibitors for skin cancers and lymphoma. Most people seem to think that this is mostly a theoretical risk and that this too may lead people away from using this treatment when it would be beneficial and we can get the take of our experts on this later. The systemic immunotherapies, here we're talking about drugs like cyclosporin and methotrexate. Uh, there can be increased risk of infection, increased risk of malignancies, blood dyscrasias, liver and kidney damage. Phototherapy can be extremely time consuming. Uh, there can be an increased risk of skin cancer with it. And finally, prednisone, systemic corticosteroids, um, the side effects of overuse of systemic steroids are sufficiently well known that I won't go into them further except to say that they're prohibitive for using this other than in the short run. So the scope of this review involves two different therapies for two different ends of the clinical spectrum of disease. One is for the drug crisoborol and I'm going to pronounce it that way because that's how the manufacturer pronounced it on the first phone call we had with them, although I've heard all sorts of people in the know also say crisabarol, so, but I'm going with crisabarol. Um, the population there is the labeled indication of adults and children with mild to moderate atopic dermatitis. And there what we'd like to be comparing it to is the other topical therapies that might be used. And then we have dupilumab, a drug intended for currently adults with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis who are inadequately controlled with topical therapy or for whom topical therapies are medically inadvisable. So much worse disease. And there the comparators include continuing emollients, continuing failed topical therapies, potentially phototherapy, 
and as a stand-in for all the systemic therapy is cyclosporin. Cyclosporin because um, most of the people we talked to felt that the experts, when they ever use systemic therapies, think cyclosporin is probably the best option. There are others that are get used. Um, but being aware that most of these therapies don't get used that much, the systemic drugs like cyclosporin and methotrexate. Um, the primary comparison is continuing failed topical therapies alone. I wanted to talk briefly about this concept, the Investigators Global Assessment, or IGA, that you all saw show up in the report. And I want to talk about it because we have these various flavors and various abbreviations. In the Crisoboral trials, ISGA, to point out the fact that it's a static measure, that is, <laughs> The assessment isn't looking at how you improved from one state to another, but just how you are. Uh, abbreviated IGA in the dupilumab trials, but that was also a static assessment. In all the trials of the recent drugs we're talking about, it was a five-point scale from zero to four, clear, almost clear, mild, moderate, or severe. In two of the old trials we're going to discuss of one of the other agents, it's a, it's a six-point scale that included a very severe option. And in some of the trials, the outcome was the likelihood of achieving clear or almost clear plus a two-point improvement, having at least a two-point move. And in others, it was just getting to clear or almost clear. Just be aware that I'll try to point out which one we're dealing with, but these are all static investigator global assessment scores. So first, we're going to look at crisoboral, <coughs> again, the drug for mild to moderate disease in children and adults, a topical therapy. The evidence comes essentially from three randomized trials that were presented in two publications. And the two key trials, 8301 and 302, that were presented together, identically designed four-week randomized trials that had 1,500 patients. There's also this 25-patient, six-week trial uh, not surprisingly, we mostly focused on the 1,500 patient trial. That trial was randomized two to one, so we have about 1,000 patients who received crisoboral for four weeks. The outcome was this ISGA of clear or almost clear and, and an improvement of two or more grades from baseline. The comparator, and you see up there where I wrote placebo, this is going to be an issue that will come up again. The placebo is the vehicle, the ointment that crisoboral is prepared in without crisoboral in it. Treatment for atopic dermatitis includes ointments like this, and this one likely works. So although we're calling it a placebo, it's not an inactive placebo. It's the vehicle ointment without the drug. I'll sometimes be calling it vehicle, sometimes placebo. Placebo itself is not a really fair term. Improvement was about 10% better over this four-week trial with the drug versus the vehicle, 32% versus 22%. Itching. At day 29, for instance, about a 10% better improvement, 63% versus 53%. We'd like to understand how this drug compares not just to its vehicle, but to the other topical therapies, but we have no head-to-head -head data. And we poked around trying to figure out something we could do to make that comparison. In the end, we found a couple of older randomized trials of the topical calcineurin inhibitor, pemicrolimus, that also used a static IgA score. It used a six-point score. So it had a very severe, where there was no very severe here. Most of the, virtually all the patients we're talking about, though, have been rated mild or moderate, and we're looking to see whether they got to clear or almost clear. So just be aware. That's why we thought that it was reasonable to try to do this comparison. The trials were published in 2002 and 2003, so a long time ago, with a lot of things changing in the interim. And know that pemicrolimus is less effective than topical tacrolimus, the other calcineurin inhibitor, at 0.1%. And it's less effective than higher potency topical corticosteroids, 
whether it's as good as low or medium potency, it's somewhere in that space of how good a drug it is, since that's what we're trying to compare to. In terms of whether it was fair in terms of the baseline severity to compare our key trials of crisoborol to this, um, if you look at the percentage of people that had moderate versus mild disease in the key trials, 61%, you know, so in the 61 to 63, 64% here, 67 to 57%, so similar degrees of moderate versus mild disease. In terms of body surface area affected, we don't have it reported for this trial, but for these two trials of crisoborol, it's around 18, 19%. Here, body surface area was 25, 26%. So this wasn't a group of people with milder disease. That said, when we stuck this all in a network meta-analysis, we came up that crisoborol was with a point estimate that's less effective than permecrolimus, 40% less effective, but with a very wide credible interval. And so it's hard to be certain about what's going on there. The best we can say is nothing about this makes us certain that crisoborol is as good or better than permecrolimus, but that doesn't mean it couldn't be. So very wide credible intervals. Again, we have these slightly different outcome measures that you can decide whether you're willing to trust or not. These trials were performed many years apart, and probably most serious for trying to interpret these data is this question of the vehicle the placebo used in the crisoborol trials that apparently was a very good vehicle. And the feeling is that the vehicle, the comparator used in the Pimecrolemus trials may not have been nearly so good. And so this may have made crisoborol not look as relatively better as it deserves. So there's real uncertainty there. Uh, crisoborol was very well tolerated. Uh, low rates of application site pain, although still higher than compared with the vehicle. What don't we know? <clears throat> Again, no trials of crisoborol against an active comparator. Safety is a major purported benefit of crisoborol. Doesn't have the black box warning, doesn't have the steroid skin changes as far as we know, but our main evidence comes from two trials with 1,000 patients for four weeks. That's what we've got, pretty much. So in summary, we have inadequate evidence relative to efficacy versus the topical corticosteroids and calcineurin inhibitors. We probably see less burning with crisoborol than with the topical calcineurin inhibitors. Long-term safety is uncertain. We have a four-week trial. Given these uncertainties about benefits and safety, we rated the evidence as I insufficient versus other topical therapies. David? Yeah. May, may I just... Um remind the, um, the council that they can ask questions of David as we go along if they need to. I just wanted to validate that the IGSA and the IGA are two related but different scales, but they were used specifically for these trials, and they don't have as much common use in daily practice as I understand it. Is that... So two things, and we can see whether the experts agree, but one, as far as I can tell, although the abbreviations used were different, these were both the same static IGA scores within the clinical trials, although not across the two, not versus the uh, trial of Microlimus, which used one, a six-point scale. Um, and I don't think these scales are used clinically very okay. often. Right. That's an excellent question. That scales aren't used clinically, and they also there's no set definition. So the definitions of the IGA, you know, in interpreting them are, are different for the across the trials. Thank you. Yeah, there's um, there's a recent systematic review that was published in the JAD a few months ago, or a couple of years ago actually, that found that there were 37 different IGAs that were used across trials, and you know some will take into account only the acute signs of atopic dermatitis, some will take in the chronic lesions. So it, it gets very hard to cross-interpret. Now, it could be all they, perform, they all perform sort of similarly. So it, it may be that it's relatively reasonable to do this, this kind of exercise, but in fact, they may be completely different results and, and not comparable in any way. Yeah. And, and agreed that these are not used at all in clinical practice. And I know you'll talk more about that when you come up, so. Thank you. And that systematic review, if anyone cares, is cited in the evidence report. So. 
Uh, we're switching now to dupilumab. Again, now we're talking about moderate to severe. I'm sorry, is there a question over there? I, I, if you don't mind, so I had a question about uh, the consistency uh, or the reliability within the trials of the raters. Um, how well trained were they? Do we, are we getting consistent use between raters on, on this? I think that's a, another excellent question and sort of site to site. And you're supposed to have the same rater for every patient at every time, but that doesn't always happen. And so the numbers are just really difficult to interpret. Okay. There's one other comment I just wanted to make real quick is that the big thing that sets uh, crisoborol apart from uh, pimacrolimus and tacrolimus is the whole black box thing. And even though most clinicians who um, use this drug and know the data don't put much weight into that, especially for pimacrolimus, which was sort of a uh, class labeling effect impact from tacrolimus where we have systemic data uh, about lymphoma risk. But it, it is a huge, huge problem for patients and for uh, for adherence because, you know, people throw away their their $1,000 tube of tacrolimus when they get it and they read the black box warning and it's just, it is what it is. Thanks. I would actually, Thanks. just uh, on the point of the measurements um, and the validity, um, it, it's a fascinating landscape of trials right now because the FDA really likes these simple global measures of the IGA. Um, and it has zero demonstrated validity to it. Um, better measurements would be things like, you know, both, you'll see yeah. some of the trial data like the Eximeria and Severity Index and other things like that. And, and it is a challenge. We have really no data demonstrating any inter or intra rate reliability or validity whatsoever. Um, even the wordsmithing that goes into different IGA scores is so subtle. I mean, if you had five people interpreting what that means without a photo atlas, it would be very hard. So I, I think it is a challenge interpreting some of the data in that respect. And, um, and it's just, it, and between trials, between the different IGAs, between the different descriptors and comments given and training sessions, I don't know how to interpret a lot of it when you're looking at just IGA alone. I think you and I think you'll address more of this when you when you both present at the at your session too, right? Yeah. Reem? David, you, um, you you mentioned and, and we know that uh, this is a relapsing disease, um, so it can come in episodes. And was in any way this uh, discussed in these trials as far as uh, you know? It's only a ten percent difference, even with the placebo or the vehicle. Um, is there any discussion around that? Around relapsing? Yes. It was a four-week trial. I don't think we know a lot about relapse. We actually, um, let me come back to that in just a moment because we're going to mention one new trial that doesn't show up totally in the evidence report yet since it was published this month. So as we switch to dupilumab, again, now we're switching to moderate to severe disease. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. One more question. Um, for the Pemecrolimus, the, the, the vehicle that was used in the, I, I know it was a long time, what do we know? Because you said the vehicle for the Crisoboral was probably better, but what do we know, do we know much about what that vehicle was for the, in the 2002-2003? The Talking with our experts and with other experts, we hear that there were concerns about the vehicle being irritating in those days. Uh, I don't know if either of you were actually involved in those uh, trials the, in any way that you know? Uh, yeah, we were, I was involved in the trial, but the vehicle is exactly the same for this drug as the, it, without the active ingredient. You're talking about Chris Abarro. Yeah. But, but for the, he's asking about the older Pimicrolimus trial. Well, I think the vehicle for the older. I think the vehicle that was tested in the trials is the same what's out there right now. It's a cream. So it's not as thick, it's not as occlusive, you're not gonna get the same emollient effect out of the vehicle itself for pimacrolimus. So whereas in the crisabrol, you're getting, you have a really thick, I think it's dimethicone-based uh, emollient, which is very occlusive, works, does a good job of moisturizing by itself, and then you have you know, active drug on top of that. So it's hard when you're comparing against a vehicle and not a true placebo. Okay, thank you. So now moving over to moderate to severe and injection. Um, we have five randomized trials that had 16 week outcomes. Three of these were our key trials, mostly the solo one and two trials, also Thachi, comparing dupilumab with placebo. 
Uh, we had two trials where we said we had only limited reporting, including Liberty AD Kronos, which was performed in patients receiving background topical corticosteroids. Uh, this month, the full results of Liberty AD Kronos were published in Lancet. Um, and we actually do have some evidence which we may end up adding to the report about relapse because that also includes one year data. Um, and there'll be one, I'll point out one other place in these slides where we added something because of Liberty Eddy Kronos. Uh, we had three additional trials that we looked at in other conditions, asthma and nasal polyposis, because we wanted to get a handle on whether there were any concerns about harms with this agent. Um, again, one of our outcome measures is this static IgA score, a five-point scale. Likelihood of achieving that uh, clear or almost clear, either with or without a two-point improvement. And I show that on this with a table of this. Here we have, with the requirement of a two-point reduction, without, so Solo included it, Thachi didn't. These are the three key trials. This is weekly dosing, every other week dosing, very similar results, way better than placebo. These are percentages of achieving that response. Again, weekly, every other week, much better than placebo. And then here's Liberty AD Kronos, the trial that was performed in patients who all of whom are getting background topical corticosteroids, essentially. Again, very similar response rates versus placebo. This is to look to see whether it was fair to lump these trials together given that there's different dosing and different background. Here we have weekly and every other week, and you can see that the effects, relative effects, were almost identical. There was very little heterogeneity, so we felt comfortable combining weekly and every other week. This is no background topical corticosteroids, Liberty AD Kronos with background. Again, very similar and very little heterogeneity. So when you see us combining things together, that's why we thought it was okay to do. So on this outcome measure, uh, we have a relative risk of about 3.9 of achieving that outcome of getting clear or almost clear, either with or without that two-point improvement, depending upon what the trial required. Similarly, despite the concerns, again, that the IgA score may not be as well done, we have the eczema area severity index, which is much, much more systematic, assesses area by area and grades what's going on. And again, we've got about a 3.3 times likelihood of achieving the primary outcome measure, which is a 75% improvement from baseline in that easy score. So easy scores get rated as an easy 50, a 50% improvement, an easy 90, a 90% improvement. The primary outcome measure that's being looked at here is an easy 75. And again, dupilumab way better than placebo at the likelihood of achieving that. Uh, we have patient reported outcomes. Uh, the solo trials in particular, and also Liberty AD Kronos eventually, um, looked at a wide range of other outcome measures, including a dermatologic quality of life measure, that improved eight to 12 points with dupilumab versus one to five points with placebo, or a four point improvement, four point difference is considered clinically significant. Itching was reduced 40 to 50% versus five to 25%. There were also reductions in anxiety and depression scores. Again, there are high rates of anxiety and depression with atopic dermatitis. On the harms side, um, harms were generally infrequent and mild. Uh, injection site reactions were more frequent with the real drug headaches, uh, conjunctivitis. Uh, I don't think people totally understand what's going on here because the asthma trials with dupilumab didn't particularly show higher rates of conjunctivitis, but the atopic dermatitis trials, including now Liberty AD Kronos in its report, also shows a higher rate of conjunctivitis. The drug seems to cause some amount of conjunctivitis. And then deaths. Uh, across all the trials, and there's now one death added here because of Liberty AD Kronos, we have five deaths among 2,400 patients. We looked at all the trials where people got the drug for at least 16 weeks for any outcome, whether it was for atopic dermatitis or asthma or nasal polyposis. The actual individual causes, 84 days after the last dose of the drug, a death from asthma in a patient who wasn't taking a controller med. 
a suicide eight days after the last dose, acute cardiac failure, metastatic gastric cancer, organizing pneumonia, core pulmonale, and now in Liberty AD Kronos, a death in a motor vehicle accident. Nobody thinks really that any of these have anything to do with the drug, but there are five deaths among 2,400 patients and zero deaths among 1,100 patients in the placebo arm, and I feel obligated to point that out as we're talking about a new drug. Uh, we wanted to try to get some sense of dupilumab, as I mentioned, against cyclosporin. We have no direct evidence. We have a systematic review that found five randomized trials comparing cyclosporin with placebo, where across various measures we're seeing 53% to 95% improvement across a whole bunch of different scores. These trials were small. They were performed many years ago. They used different outcome measures than the current <coughs> trial. Uh, we found one trial from 2001, Granland, in 72 patients, a little trial comparing cyclosporin and phototherapy. And it looked at the SCORAD measure, um, as did our key trials. And if you look here, uh, first this is the baseline score. And this is solo, 65, 68, higher is more severe disease. So Thachi and the solo trials, very similar baseline. Granlund, not quite so severe. Reductions of 52 to 57% versus 55% in Granlund, so very similar percentage reductions. So similar reductions, but less severe disease at baseline. So depending on how you want to play that, you could imagine, well, they were treating less severe disease, of course it would do better. Or if there was more room for improvement, the people had more severe disease, and so they had more space to get improvement. It shows the sort of uncertainties we have trying to look at the evidence on comparative efficacy. Cyclosporin has well-known harms. Acute and chronic nephrotoxicity uh, causes, can cause high blood pressure, increased risks for infections and cancer. In general, guidelines for atopic dermatitis suggest not treating for more than one year. So um, is, just to remind me, is treatment of AD with cyclosporin labeled? It is not. It is not. We have no, uh, prednisone is pretty much the only label systemic. Thank you. And also, I would also assume that there aren't specific dosing targets for AD that, that relate to this treatment, that it's uh, I'll back of the envelope. There, our experts are shaking their heads, so I'll assume not. We try to follow, you know, troughs for toxicity, but there's no efficacy. And one of the challenges with the evidence for cyclosporin is that you have very few trials. There's only three actual RCTs that are not blinded or well done. Um, and for all of them, you have variable dosing strategies. So, and then, you know, the question of how do you, how do they standardize easy score and things like that, that was never addressed in any of these. So it, it is, it, anecdotally and clinically, it does work in patients, but you really do run into dosing problems. And then the higher the doses, the more efficacy, but then the more toxicity, and then you really run into issues. Thank you. Um, we also wanted to get some sense against phototherapy. Various groups asked us to include phototherapy. In Gramland, cyclosporin was significantly superior to phototherapy in that randomized trial we were just talking about. So based on that, and also other trials, dupilumab certainly looks to be more effective than phototherapy. Uh, phototherapy can be very time consuming, may increase the risk of skin cancer. Uh, very, very time consuming potentially for severe disease to the point where I think most of the time for that end of the spectrum, people wouldn't try to use it. What don't we know here? Well, we've got a novel therapy and we lack adequate long-term safety data. We have no head-to-head -head trials against systemic agents. Um, Patients had more severe disease than the entry criteria for the randomized trials. So if you look at SOLO 1 and 2, entry criteria uh, required a baseline easy score of 16. Remember, higher scores, again, are more severe disease. So what was required was 16, but the actual average easy going into the trial was 30. It required a body surface area involvement of 10%, but the actual body surface area involved was 50%. So the patients in the trials were sick, sicker even than the entry criteria for the trial. Um, efficacy and required treatment are unclear over the long run. So we both don't know. We have a little bit more now with Liberty AD Kronos over a year. 
uh, where we do see continued efficacy for a year. But we don't know what would happen three, four, five years out in this chronic disease. And on the other side, we don't know that you need continuing therapy for three, four, five years. We don't know what happens to the course of disease. Um, you know, it obviously has implications for the value of the therapy if you could stop it at some point and people stayed well. Um, and as I think you'll hear from our experts and others, there are anecdotal reports of dramatic improvements with this agent, unlike things that those experts feel they've seen with other agents, for what that's worth. Um, as Steve Pearson mentioned, other benefits or disadvantages and contextual considerations. There's a long list in the report. I'm highlighting a few here. Dupilumab is an injection that's given every two weeks, dramatically less time consuming than topical therapies, if you're able to get away from using those topical therapies with this. Um, obviously, also, though, there are patients who are terrified of needles, and it will be potentially more burdensome for some patients. We're not looking at productivity effects. We heard about issues of presenteeism, of missed work, and all of that. That's not showing up either in the evidence report or in our models because we don't have good data on productivity outcomes. It's easy to believe, though, that people who are very sick or of an age, at a working age, may be more productive if they're feeling better. Uh, from a contextual consideration, there can be important lifetime burden of illness. A lot of the people who end up with, as adults, with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis began with the disease as children. And so they've had this disease their whole lives and they're going to continue having it their whole lives. So in summary, we have substantial improvements in the majority of patients getting dupilumab. Uh, it was well tolerated, though there was increased conjunctivitis. Deaths were felt unrelated to treatment important adverse effects could show up over time. It's a new systemic biologic agent. Um, it appears to be at least as efficacious as cyclosporin, which has well-known toxicities. And given the uncertainties about safety, we, we rated dupilumab incremental or better versus essentially failed topicals, and comparable or better versus cyclosporin. Uh, we received public comments. One was that uh, dupilumab should be analyzed as moderate to severe as a single group the way it was studied. Uh, I would point out that in the evidence we have from the SOLO trial, it's possible to look at the moderate group and the severe group and see that their baseline utilities are very different, that the severe patients really do have more severe disease, the moderate patients have less severe disease, and we thought it would be interesting to you all as a group to see the results split by moderate uh, and severe. And as you see in the voting questions, you also have one for combined moderate to severe as it was studied. Uh, we got a comment that the benefit to risk of dupilumab clearly exceeds that of cyclosporin, a drug with known toxicities. Um, Cyclosporin has known toxicities. We've been using it a really long time. We have a nephrologist here. We really understand those toxicities. With dupilumab, we're not seeing those toxicities in the trials so far, and maybe they don't exist, or maybe they will show up. There was a publication in JAMA that maybe some of you saw this month showing that about 32% of new drugs um, end up with a safety signal after release and that the risk for that was double, the relative risk of getting a safety signal was double in a new biologic. So that's where we are. Um, we got a comment similarly that dupilumab is superior to emollients, not incremental, plus the way we rated it. Dupilumab works way better than emollients. There's no question about that from the randomized trials. Our issue still is on the safety side. If we have a safety concern, we have that same safety concern. This isn't a criticism of dupilumab. It's not a criticism of the randomized trials. It's an inherent problem with any new drug that hasn't been around for five years used in tens of thousands of patients where rare side effects start showing up, as that's the experience of where we see those side effects. We don't find them in the randomized trials. Um, we got a comment that 
the benefits of avoiding improper treatment with systemic corticosteroids aren't captured well, that people get mismanaged essentially and they're getting systemic corticosteroids and getting harm from that. Many of the comments we got about you didn't capture that in our model, Marita Zimmerman will address because really we did capture stuff in the model. But misuse of corticosteroids over a long period of time could occur way out past when the randomized trials occur. And so we might not have fully been able to capture that within the evidence we're presenting. And so we added a comment about that, two other benefits and disadvantages within the report based on that comment. Uh, and finally, we got the comment that there are inadequate data to comment on for subaural uh, compared with the other topicals. Um, and we had tried in an earlier version to say more about the relative efficacy um, compared to the other agents. We've left in my best attempt to present you what I could versus pomecrolemus and tell you where pomecrolemus falls. But we took out uh, those data because ultimately we really do think we have inadequate evidence to make that comparison. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, now I think we can hear from Dr. Zimmerman. And just to remind the council, we'll have more chance to discuss uncertainties with our experts when the afternoon reconvenes, too. Okay. Uh, I'm Marita Zimmerman from University of Washington, and I'm going to go over our economic model. I have no conflicts of interest relevant to this report. So the objective of this analysis was to estimate the cost effectiveness of dupilumab for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis compared to usual care over a lifetime horizon. The target population was adults with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis who had failed topical therapy. The mean age of patients entering the model was, 50, was 38 and 53% were male. So I'm going to present the results for our base case analysis, which included moderate and severe patients. 53% uh, were moderate, and that represents the proportions in the trial populations. But I'm also going to present subpopulations of just moderate patients and just severe patients separately, so you can see that as well. I'm going to start by going over our methods. We compared two interventions in this model, dupilumab and usual care without dupilumab. Uh, we chose not to include crisoboral because there was enough of a lack of evidence that we didn't feel modeling was justified. So we modeled based on responder categories. So patients were in health states based on responding using the easy score. So all patients entered the model in a usual care state, um, baseline, no response. And we had four month cycles. So in the first cycle, patients could enter three responder categories, easy 50, easy 75, and easy 90. And again, that's 50, 75, and 90 percent uh, improvement from baseline. So once patients are in these three, oh, and patients have a higher probability of getting to those states if they're taking dupilumab compared to usual care. So once they're in these states, in subsequent cycles, <coughs> they can transition back to <coughs> usual care. And then from any state, patients can transition to death. So once we had these probabilities and patients enter these responder states, we apply a quality of life value to each state, and then we sum that over the patient's remaining lifetime. I'm going to go through a few of the key model assumptions for this. As I mentioned, patients only enter the responder categories in the first cycle. And then once they're in those three responder categories, they don't switch between them, between easy 50, 75, and 90. They stay in one. And then going back to that usual care state, we assume that for patients taking dupilumab, that discontinuation happens as they discontinue the drug. And that rate was constant over time. And it was the same for all three responder categories. For patients who were, had usual care, but they were responders, so they're in one of those three responder categories, they transitioned back to that baseline level at a rate equivalent to the recurrence rate for usual care in the trials. And then finally, we assume that atopic, derm uh, atopic dermatitis disease and the treatments don't affect mortality. 
All right, these are a few of our key clinical inputs. So the first one uh, is the probability that patients would transition to those responder categories. And these rates are from the trials, so you'll see the rates for moderate patients on the top and severe patients on the bottom. Um, I'll point out that if you look at the percent responders for moderate patients, if you summed all of those together, it's a higher percentage than for severe. So we see more moderate patients responding, and also for the moderate patients, it's skewed towards the higher level. So the highest number that we see is 41% for the easy 90 responders um, that are moderate patients. And then transitioning back to that no response category, for dupilumab, uh, I mentioned that's the discontinuation rate, so that's happening as patients stop the drug, and that's 6.3% annually. And then for usual care, we see a much higher rate. Those patients are transitioning back at 65.8% every 16 weeks. And here are our utility values representing quality of life. Um, so at baseline, the patients who have moderate disease are starting at 0.684, and severe patients have lower quality of life of 0.535. When we get to the responder categories, we see that the utilities are much more similar, um, both between the easy responder categories and between moderate and severe. So it's ranging from 0.89 to 0.91 or so. So the important part of that is that the severe patients are starting off lower, so that jump that they got, the delta, when they get to responder categories is bigger. They're getting a larger improvement in quality of life. And then our final clinical input was adverse events. We used three adverse events in this model, injection site reaction, allergic conjunctivitis, and infectious conjunctivitis. And we applied rates for each of those from the trials and then used a cost and a disutility for quality of life for each of those events. For our economic inputs, uh, of course, we first use the price of the drug. The list price of this drug is $37,000. And then in communicating with the manufacturer, we used a net price of $31,000. So that's the price that includes any rebates or discounts. And then uh, we also included a one-time self-injector training cost of $20. For our other healthcare costs, our goal for this was to include any other costs besides the drug. So these costs are based on claims data. And in order, so, so I should say first that these costs include all other healthcare costs. So it could be doctor visits, it could be hospitalizations, it could be ER visits. And these would capture things like if a patient had an asthma attack or if a patient had an infection, those costs are included here. So we first measured costs for patients who were using phototherapy or a systemic immunomodulatory medication. And we assume that the costs for that patient group are representative of the patients who are non-responders or have usual care in our modeled patient population. And then we measured the cost for patients without those treatments, no photother phototherapy or systemic immunomodulatory medications, and we assume that those costs are representative of the cost for responders. So that's how we got the two different costs. And then we took out costs of prescription medications because we assumed that in our population, our modeled population, the patients wouldn't be taking other prescription uh, treatments. And our results. So here's our base case results. This is including moderate and severe patients. On the top panel, you see the results using the list price for dupilumab, and on the bottom, we're using the net price. For the usual care patients, the total costs over their remaining lifetime, and all of these values are discounted, uh, the costs were about $271,000, and that led to 14.37 qualies. For dupilumab patients, the total costs were just over $509,000, and that led to 16.28 qualies. Of that $509,000, 268,000 were drug costs. So of course, those patients have increased drug costs, but we do see some cost offset because the other underlying healthcare costs are lower for dupilumab patients. So those incremental values led to an incremental cost effectiveness ratio of $124,000.
if we use the net price for dupilumab, the underlying healthcare costs stay the same and the quality stay the same. So we just see that the drug costs go down from 267,000 to 224,000. So that smaller cost difference leads to an ICER of just over $100,000. And here's our results for the moderate and severe subpopulation separately. So you'll see that for moderate patients, the incremental costs, the difference in costs are higher, and the incremental qualities, the difference in health gains, are lower. So you're getting fewer health gains for more costs compared to the total population, which leads to a higher incremental cost effectiveness ratio of $130,000. For severe patients, we see the opposite, that we're getting more health gains, uh, the incremental qualities are higher, for less cost. So that leads to a lower ICER of $78,000. And the reason we're seeing this, so the cost for moderate patients, the incremental costs are higher because we see more responders in the moderate group. So more of those patients are taking drugs and more patients are staying on dupilumab for a longer period of time. So even though their underlying costs are lower than the severe patients, we're seeing higher incremental costs because there's more drug costs because they're responding more. For the qualities, we see that in severe patients, because that baseline utility value is lower, they're getting that bigger jump in quality of life. So even though fewer patients are responding, that, that bigger improvement in quality of life is really having a big impact and showing that we get a lot of health gains in that population. And here's a tornado diagram. This shows our one-way sensitivity analysis, and this just shows what the key drivers are for this model. And we see that the utility value used for non-responders is a key driver, as well as the price of dupilumab. And in case this is too small, I'll just point out that the, rate, the total range, um, even for the highest values, is from about $80,000 to $130,000 per quality. <clears throat> and then the final result I'm going to show you is the result of our probabilistic sensitivity analysis. And this analysis just measures the distribution of all of the inputs to our model at once. So this is showing the total uncertainty in the model. And on the x-axis, we have willingness to pay thresholds ranging from zero to $300,000 per quality on this axis. And then on the y-axis is the probability that dupilumab is cost-effective compared to usual care. So if we choose a low willingness to pay threshold of $50,000, we see that there's only a 2% probability that dupilumab is cost-effective. But if we choose a higher threshold of $100,000, we get up to 58% probability. And if we choose $150,000 per quality, we get up to an 88% probability that dupilumab is cost effective. Of course, as any model, there are limitations to what we can do. We have limited data, as David talked about, uh, for health outcomes over long periods of time, particularly for sustained response rates or discontinuation rates. We also have limited data for costs for this population. And if we want to look at costs by different severity levels, we're even more limited. And finally, we know that atopic dermatitis is a heterogeneous condition. We know that patients experience a wide range of symptoms and severity levels, and that's difficult to capture all of the heterogeneity in a modeling exercise. In summary, we found that dupilumab does improve health outcomes compared to usual care, but at additional costs. At the discounted price that we presented here, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio was at or below commonly cited thresholds for cost effectiveness. Dupilumab was projected to be more cost effective for patients with severe atopic dermatitis, but even for patients with moderate disease, the ICER remained below the upper thresholds of commonly cited willingness to pay. And I just want to finish by mentioning a few of the really important comments that we received throughout this process. And these comments guided how we modeled this population. So uh, David pointed this out too, but one of the comments that we got is that comorbidities are really important for this population and asthma and, and infections should be included. The way that we modeled this, we can't explicitly tease out the effects on those comorbidities 
but these comorbidities are included in the model. Both the quality of life values and the costs include patients who had these comorbidities during the trial um, measurement time. So any effects on the quality of life or the costs would be included. We also got the comment that results should be presented for the full population and not stratified by severity. Again, we, did, we do think that that's an important population. It's our base case analysis. But we think that we know that there's differences between these two populations. And we thought it's useful to see how the results might change based on which population you're looking at. And then relatedly, we got the comment that model inputs can't reflect a heterogeneous patient population. And that is a limitation of a modeling exercise. It's difficult to capture a lot of different kinds of patients. That's one of the reasons that we looked at moderate and severe separately. Um, and I'll just point out that although we can't talk separately about different types of patients aside from moderate and severe, the inputs that we're using for the model attempt to capture a wide range of patients in aggregate. So we hope that this model is reflecting a heterogeneous population just in an aggregate way. Thanks. Thanks. Any questions, Dr. Pollack? Uh, it seems to me that the critical, thank you by the way mm -hmm. for a terrific, both, both the presentations uh, were terrific. Uh, it seems to me that the utility assessments are quite low, both the 535 mm -hmm. and the uh, 0.684 when I think about other severe conditions and that's really driving mm -hmm. uh, those point estimates. When I, when I think about the kinds of severe conditions that have those types of really low utility assessments, I get to things that are really much more severe and life-threatening, at least in the sense of the mortality effects. H how are you thinking about that? Yeah. And, uh, and are there, what are the kinds of conditions that have similar utility assessments that you view as comparable to this? condition. Yeah, we thought the same thing. Um, in the initial version of this report, we were actually using higher values for utilities. These values come from the trial. U quality of life was measured during the trials for the patient population that we're looking at. And we thought, these are way too low. This doesn't compare to other utilities that have been measured in atopic dermatitis in the past. And so we talked a lot with the manufacturer um, about how they measured quality of life and did a more thorough comparison to other studies and other conditions. And this population was really sick. And they measured these quality of life values in a very methodologically sound way. And we prefer to use the values from the actual population that we're modeling if we believe it's valid. And we had no reason to believe that these weren't measured correctly, and this patient population is sicker, these are moderate to severe patients, and they are sicker than the patients whose quality of life was measured for atopic dermatitis in a lot of the previous studies of quality of life. And we also uh, felt better about these values in seeing the difference between moderate and severe, um, knowing that we would expect there to be a difference between those patients and that that showed up in the data. And then one, one quick follow-up, mm -hmm. which is the comorbidities are important in that. And are those comorbidities being moved by, are we, how confident are we that the comorbidities that are generating some of those low initial quality of life measures are moving because of the treatment? And how does that fit into it? I may, I'm a little confused about how that, how mm -hmm. those, the comorbidities enter this. Yeah. Um, David can probably talk more about the comorbidities as well. Patients weren't excluded from the trial because of comorbidities, so those are definitely part of their quality of life. Um, and we think that that's important because that is a part of patients' quality of life and we want that to be included in the model. In terms of how it affects the change in quality of life, that is also likely influencing it. We don't know explicitly, as far as I know, how much those comorbidities change throughout the trial. Um, and it's likely that those are reducing. But we can't say, based on the data, how much of that quality of life change is based on just comorbidities and how much is just atopic dermatitis. Can I add one point to that, if I pipe in just to the two questions? Let me, let me make a comment so that it may relate to what you're going to. 
So on that same point, the, com the cost of the comorbidities in terms of health care costs were also captured in the usual care. So that would be taken into account too. Yes. Okay. Good. Let me ask David to respond first, sure, Jonathan, sure, sure. if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so when we're talking about this, mostly we're talking about asthma um, because that's the one that's common enough and severe enough that you could imagine it playing a role. We don't have the data stratified by people with asthma and without asthma. I have to say, looking at what happened in the trial and how low the baseline utilities are, I think we're mostly seeing an effect on the dermatologic condition with some additional benefit in asthma, not that we're mistaking an asthma benefit for a dermatologic benefit. That just doesn't seem to fit with the utilities we're seeing. Yeah, I, I would just add, um, so I, I do some of this research, and in, in my patient cohort, now granted it's a very biased, you know, referral bias, um, we actually see even lower qualities than the ones that, you know, utility scores. You know, you use problems with global health, backwalk to EQ5D, but it's actually lower than the patient population getting in, in, in these numbers. So if you see these worst of the worst, you understand just how bad they are. You know, there, there's this common misconception of it's just eczema. And for the milder main cases, okay, maybe you could argue that. But for the moderate to severe, it's, it's a different animal. Um, with respect to the comorbidities, I think part of the complexity is, yes, you'll see a little budge in asthma there. But what, a big part of atopic dermatitis are sort of these extended symptoms. So let's say infections. Skin infections are a big one. Patients are getting managed with repeated courses of antibiotics, things like that, often hospitalized for skin infections. There's lower rates. That when you improve the skin disease, that goes down. So that's a direct part of the disease. You could call it a comorbidity, or you could almost call it a symptom of the atopic dermatitis. Mental health is another one. You know, higher rates of depression, anxiety. For years, we were calling these associations. But what's fascinating about the, the data from the Dupilumab studies is you look at the hospital anxiety depression score, the HAD score, and you watch those scores just tank. They go, you know, there's patients who meet full criteria for anxiety and depression, and then they go back to a baseline of just being basically clear. So do you call that a, an improvement of the comorbidity, or do you call that an improvement of mental health symptoms of the disease? I think it's, it's kind of arbitrary. I would argue it's probably the latter. So I think that's part of sort of this complexity of understanding that this is a much more global disease than just looking at the lesions per se. Any other questions? Yes, one, Scott. One question related to the recurrence rate. There seemed to be a big difference in the recurrence rate between the dupilumab and the usual care. Usual care based on old data over 16 weeks, and then this 6.3 percent based on data and file. Can you talk about how that would influence the findings at all? Mm -hmm. You're right. That is a very big difference. Um, we expect that usual care patients would go back to baseline very quickly because these are moderate and severe patients and we don't expect that those therapies that they're using work very well for them. So you could almost say that it's more surprising that they go into the responder categories in the first place. Uh, and for dupilumab, it is very low. We actually debated about a lot of times in clinical trials, discontinuation rates can be lower because there's more follow-up, there's more interaction with the physician. So we might expect that the discontinuation rate um, would be higher in real practice. And we did a review related to that to see if we should be using a, a higher number there. And we actually found that in equivalent uh, conditions and treatments that we thought could be representative of this population, the discontinuation rates were even lower in regular practice, probably because there's tighter follow-up of things that could be adverse events in clinical trials. But we left it at the trial value because we thought this is already very low discontinuation. Um, so I, I think that the difference could be really that big. Dr. Johnson. So with your assumptions, you said that there would be a $20 uh, training fee, meaning that most of these patients would be expected to self-administer. 
which means that the drug would come through a pharmacy benefit and you would potentially either get it from a specialty pharmacy or get it filled at your local pharmacy. You pay a copay and so forth. Many plans pay off of an AWP discounted, a discount off of AWP. When this drug came to market, it, it sounded like from the report that, that the manufacturer said that the list price will be $37,000, but actually AWP is listed at 44, 000, over $44,000. So when you take a typical discount off of that, you land on about 37000 as a net price. So should we be considering the top one instead of the bottom one since it's actually priced higher than mm -hmm. as far as AWP when, when we go to consider our votes? Yeah. Um, we can't be sure what the net price is going to be. Usually in these uh, calculations, we use at least four quarters of data of sales prices to figure out what the net price is going to be. Um, it's what the manufacturer told us their discounts are going to be. Not that they're forced to, to use that value just because it's in this report, but um, that, you know, that's what we think it's going to be. It's the best estimate that we have. At least it'll be somewhere in that range. Sounds good. Um, we, we actually are a little bit ahead of schedule. If we could have our manufacturers team come up to the to the front and sit and and present um, so this would be uh, Yu Feng Lu thank you and also Stephen Faulkner so and while they're coming up I just have Marita a quick go ahead and, and, and please great great nice to have the person from Santa yeah if you could if you could address the net pricing Issues, if you don't mind, if if you would like to. Yeah, great. You want to come up? Yeah, no problem. Is this on? Yeah. It should be. And just just briefly introduce yourself to the sure, audience, sure, sure, please. I said I've been watching too much news. I feel like I'm at a congressional hearing. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, my name is uh, Steve Faulkner. I'm a senior director for Pfizer Pharmaceuticals within our medical outcomes division. I'm joined by my colleague in the back, uh, Amy Krauss, who is a field medical director in the area of dermatology. So we're here to um, represent Pfizer with UCRISA today, um, and we'd be happy to answer any questions after we go through our brief statement that you might have about uh, the product. We do have uh, a few paragraphs that we um, have a statement from Pfizer, so I'm here to read those and present those to you. So real quickly, if you bear with me, uh, we appreciate ICER's efforts to engage uh, stakeholders as part of the clinical and economic evidence review process. Uh, Pfizer has submitted several comment letters to ICER over the past few months, uh, most recently in the area of rheumatology, but obviously today in the area of atopic dermatitis. Uh, so we appreciate the fact that ICER's process now allows for these comments to be made available to all stakeholders, and we appreciate ICER's efforts to specifically address the points made by the commenters. While the revised document has made some important improvements based on our feedback, uh, we remain concerned that ICER's atopic dermatitis report continues to minimize the unmet clinical need among patients with mild to moderate atopic dermatitis. Uh, the statement uh, that mild to moderate disease can be effectively controlled with existing topical therapies still appears in the latest version of the report. Several other commenters shared uh, different viewpoints that challenge the accuracy of the statement. Um, so for example, the American Academy of Dermatology's Atopic Dermatitis Expert Resource Group highlighted the challenges of long-term topical steroid use and further noted that the use of topical steroids, um, depending on site of application, can be ill-advised. Additionally, this group highlighted the safety concerns associated with the topical calcium inhibitors, uh, meant that alternative chronic therapies were needed in mild to moderate disease. Also, members of the International Eczema Council also offered similar remarks in their comments letter to ICER. In its conversation with patients, ICER has clearly understood the burden that chronic atopic dermatitis places on patients and th their families. We ask that this understanding of the burden of the disease, uh, combined with the commentary referenced above, uh, be considered 
as ICER examines the unmet need for existing um, therapies within this population. Further, we ask that ICER reconsider how it frames comparative clinical efficacy of crisoborol. As we noted in our comment letter to you, we feel that the methodology employed to make comparative clinical comparisons has important limitations, which has been pointed out here as well. ICER's response to our comments on these limitations seems to suggest ICER's belief that the use of imperfect approaches in the absence of better methods is needed to inform physicians and patient decision making. Uh, we would disagree as a company and would suggest, for example, that, that the lack of non-comparability data with respect to the five to six point scale does not mean that comparability should be assumed. Similarly, we ask again that Pfizer or ICER reconsider the use of the evaluative term such as moderately higher in reference to Crisoboral's clinical trial results. ICER suggests that this term reflects relative efficacy, not statistical significance, and thus its use is appropriate. We, uh, as Pfizer, disagree with that and note that interpretations of relative efficacy or clinical significance should be left to the clinical experts and clinicians. We ask that ICER focus its efforts on reporting the factual results of clinical trials so that healthcare stakeholders can make the best informed decisions on treatments based solely on clear data. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Faulkner. Uh, David or Marita, do you have sure. any, any response to that? Yeah. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a primary care doctor, and I'm never going to prescribe anybody dupilumab. Um, sure. It's way outside the realm of things I might do. But I see patients with atopic dermatitis with a severity of disease where they could potentially receive crisoboral. And I know what sort of evidence I want. Unfortunately, we don't have it. And so we're doing our best to inform doctors like me and dermatologists where the data takes us while putting caveats, as you've all heard, everywhere on that data. I will say you all could help me and ICER and everyone else a ton if we had a randomized trial of your agent against another therapy. That's always the golden thing that we strive for, but, you know, for indication and a pivotal trial, that's where we start. I, I guess when we asked, we heard that no such trial is underway, though. Is that right? Not, not right now, no. Okay. Dr. Zimmerman, any, any comments? Or? No, thank you. So, um, Ms. Liu? Hi, my name is Yufang. And just pull, pull your microphone up, yes. My great. name is Yufang Liu, uh, med, uh, Executive Medical Director. Um, in at Regeneral Medical Affairs. I'm here to represent San Francisco and Regeneral uh, to read a statement to you. San Francisco and Regeneral are proud to bring Dupixin to adults with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis uncontrolled with topical therapy. Dupixin was approved by the FDA with priority review, which is reserved for medicines that represent potentially significant improvement in safety or efficacy for serious condition. This follows the FDA's 2014 breakthrough therapy designation for Dupixin. Breakthrough therapy designation was created by the FDA to ex expedite the development and review of drugs for serious or life-threatening conditions. And Dupixin represents the first time this designation was granted for a dermatological disease other than in dermatological cancers. Dupixin marks the first systemic agent approved in nearly 20 years for this patient population. We believe that medicine should have strong values for the patient that use them, the healthcare system, and society overall. We carefully considered several factors in the process of determining a value-based price for Dupixin and proactively engaged with various stakeholders on this topic, including ICER. We are pleased that ISO's independent assessment concluded that the price of Dupixin is aligned with the value it brings to patients with this disease. We would like to thank ISO for engaging us throughout the process and hope we can continue to have an open dialogue if ISO performs assessments of other therapies by Sanfigenzam and Regeneron. In the context of this open meeting, we have two comments for your consideration. 
We agree that ISO's conclusion that dupristin is cost effective for patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis on control with topical therapy. However, we believe that it is not clinically meaningful to perform an assessment of long-term value of dupristin for patients with moderate disease and a separate one for patients with severe disease. Such assessments were not performed for ISO's reports for other indications such as psoriasis. Furthermore, atopic dermatitis is a chronic condition where the severity of signs and symptoms wax and wane over the course of the disease. Therefore, severity scales based on only on a static measure of skin signs at a particular time point are of limited relevance in a clinical setting. Our other comment is about the voting questions comparing the net health benefit of depiction with cyclosporin. Cyclosporin is not approved by the FDA for the treatment of atopic dermatitis. We believe that it is not appropriate to compare the value of depiction to therapy that is not approved for, to treat atopic dermatitis, especially one with significant safety issues that potentially render it unsuitable to treat a chronic disease that requires long-term management. We appreciate the opportunity to participate in this meeting, and we look forward to the continued upcoming discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Liu. Um, any response, David or Marita? Um, I, I think you're all aware of how many therapies are used off-label, and uh, we tried to pick among the many off-label therapies that are used, the ones that our experts told us was best uh, to ask you to compare those. It is made clear throughout the report that it's not FDA approved. Any questions or reflections from CPAC? Rachel? Well, Ryan's got a oh, Go ahead. I just w wondered if you had a, did you want to respond to Jill's comment about the average wholesale price? Is that what, yeah. The, I, I'm from a medical uh, organization, so I really don't have, personally, oh, I don't okay. have comment on that. I, I don't think we have, can you go? So, uh, David, David, do you mind stepping to a microphone just so the people on the, please have a seat. Thank you. And, and why don't you introduce yourself? So, <clears throat> my name's David, David Meeker, I'm on a uh, panel uh, later. Um, head of uh, Sanofi Genzyme. We work obviously closely in partnership with Regenera on this. Um, the setting of the price, and I'm not a pricing expert, so I'm a physician by training, just put that in context. Um, the only two prices we control are the list and the net, and the discounts that we give to other parts of the system. So the discounts we give to the wholesalers, the discounts we give to different payers as part of the system. The AWP, as I understand, is the markup that the wholesalers apply if they do apply it in selling it out from there. So again, I, I don't think that's the appropriate reference point. I don't know where the AWP will be. Um, and again, uh, you know, the extent to which that is the, the amount that the system is paying for the drug, you know, again, I go back to the two prices, that, the two numbers that we control um, for this assessment, so. Thank you. Yes, Rachel. Uh, can, can you comment on whether those discounts are likely to be passed along to the patients? It may not be directly relevant for part of the analysis, but we might think it relevant to adherence and, and patients who decide to fulfill the prescriptions. Yeah, so there's different parts of this. So we provide copay assistance support. We live in America. Um, with all the complexities of our payer system and the, the way that the different parts of the supply chain, if you will, participate in between the step of leaving the manufacturer and then ultimately ending up in the hands of the patient. So, you know, the PBMs, the insurance plans, um, because that at the pharmacy level. So those are all things that you need to take into consideration. I mean, the, the, the PBMs do pass on a significant amount, as they state. We don't know how much, and we have no idea in this case. Um, to the insurance plan, but again, I, I can't comment further. I'll also, I'll also mention that uh, this, our, our economic modeling is only from the payer perspective, so we didn't explicitly look at costs to the patient. Generally, co-pays and co-insurance are based on the list price of the drug, um, but if there's things like co-pay assistance, we didn't directly include that in the model. Any other questions? It's a good discussion, Eric. But would that be reflected in your net price? Yeah. Okay. 
Great. So thank you all very much. Um, I think we're now going to, since we're ahead of schedule, move into the public comments. We have three, um, three people who are going to provide public comments at this standing microphone right here. And the first will be uh, Dr. Amy Paller from the International Eczema Council. Dr. Paller. Yes. Please step to the microphone here. Great. And you have about between about three to five minutes. Thank you. Okay. I'll go pretty quickly. Please, please uh, introduce yourself and also any conflicts that you may have, please. All right, thank you. I, I do appreciate the opportunity to address the Midwest Comparative Effectiveness Public Advisory Council advisor about atopic dermatitis. I'm here representing, I'm Amy Paller, and I'm here representing uh, the International Eczema Council as its president, but I also serve as the immediate past co-chair of the Pediatric Dermatology Research Alliance, and I'm an active member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the National Eczema Association. In full disclosure, I've been an investigator and a consultant for both Pfizer and also for Regeneron Sanofi. Um, I'm currently the Walter J. Hamlin Professor and Chair of Dermatology and Professor of Pediatrics at Northwestern University here in Chicago, so I'm taking the opportunity to address you today. I'm also the Principal Investigator of our NIH-funded Skin Disease Research Center at Northwestern. But most importantly, I've been a practicing dermatologist for more than 30 years with a specialization in caring for individuals afflicted by atopic dermatitis. We have one of the largest and most respected centers for atopic dermatitis in the world and have cared for th several thousands of more severely affected adults and children. Today I want to just share with you some of my experiences as a clinician and researcher in atopic dermatitis. I really can't emphasize enough the high burden and the many comorbidities of this disease, as well as the high unmet need for both safe and effective topical and systemic long-term treatments. Even in children and adults with mild to moderate atopic dermatitis, many remain inadequately treated or even untreated because of fears, whether founded or not, associated with the use of topical steroids and topical calcineurin inhibitors. Crisoboral has been the only effective topical agent that doesn't have a theoretical or established side effect profile that would limit its use, especially for long-term use. And one of my greatest challenges as a physician is improving the lives of my patients with more severe eczema. I've spoken to so many adults whose lives have been turned upside down by their skin disease and their families as well. The painful, often generalized and weeping skin prevents them from working, walking without pain, having a social life, caring for family as they'd like, or even taking a shower, normal daily activities that we take for granted. We know that high rates of anxiety, depression, and even suicidal ideation are part of atopic dermatitis, not to mention the infection and the recurrent hospitalizations. But it's the itch that leads to the constant torment. It's been likened to fire ants, poison ivy everywhere and all the time. Just think about having a few mosquito bites from enjoying a summer evening and how much you might have to dig to stop the itch. Now multiply that to cover most of your body day in and day out and worse throughout the night. Patients with atopic dermatitis and their families have not slept through the night for months or even years because of the unbearable itch. Before the approval of dupilumab in late March, significantly helping our patients was more difficult. All of the available systemic treatments have had major drawbacks and potential side effects, and particularly cyclosporin. Systemic steroids have been an easy fix, but with significant side effects and a tendency towards severe rebound when stopped, I avoid them and prescribe other immunosuppressants but not one is suitable for long-term use, despite atopic dermatitis being a chronic disease that usually continues for years with the unabated daily life-altering effects that I and uh, others here you've heard of talk about. Patients and families are fearful of using systemic immunosuppressants, and so are we as doctors, and yet we often have no choice given the horrendous impact of atopic dermatitis on people's lives. Even with the use of systemic immunosuppressing drugs, many of our patients have only partial improvement or sometimes none at all. They still suffer terribly. As a result, many of our patients remain essentially untreated. Dupilumab is the first targeted long-term therapy available for this pa these patients. Based on the clinical trials, and I realize we don't have long-term huge numbers yet, but based on the clinical trials, the safety profile is just not able to be compared with these systemic immunosuppressants that we're using, including cyclosporin, in which we regularly see problems occur. 
But the relief that has been experienced by adult atopic dermatitis sufferers fortunate enough to be in these trials of dupilumab has been priceless, and we have seen that. As a, as, excuse me, as a clinician who has struggled for years to find creative ways to relieve the itch and burden of atopic dermatitis for so many, I'm really excited about the emergence at long last of new and promising treatments. I welcome the opportunity to continue this dialogue with you at this crucial period for AD sufferers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Paller. Um, David and uh, Dr. Zimmerman, any 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 thoughts from the from the council? I think we appreciate that. Um, next is um, from the National Eczema Association is uh, Tim Smith. Tim, again, um, introduce yourself, complex, and about three to five minutes, please. Certainly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, my name is Tim Smith. I'm the Vice President of Advocacy and Access with the National Eczema Association. The National Eczema Association is a national organization that is dedicated to the treatment of people with AD. Uh, our primary focus is increasing awareness of, of the disease and access to treatments for people with the disease. Uh, we'd like to begin by thanking you uh, for being so proactive uh, in including patient uh, perceptions of value and patient interest in your assessment of the study. One of the things that I don't think is recognized fully in the report and should be recognized um, by the patient advocacy community is that uh, ICER has been incredibly proactive. They reached out to uh, NIA and to one of its partner organizations, the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of, of America, very early on in the process to pull us for uh, perceptions to, to, to ask how to, to get at patient perceptions of what value is and of what effect is. Um, they, had, they held the unusual step of holding a listening session with uh, a patient who has a severe uh, form of, of AD. And uh, I mean, that was an hour long process. Uh, we appreciate that you've been so proactive and uh, thank you for trying to include patients' perceptions of value. Um, so proactively in, in, in this process. Uh, as uh, you consider the questions before the committee today, we encourage you um, not only to consider just what's in the report, but what, as the report acknowledges, um, a lot of what's captured both in the clinical assessment and in the cost effectiveness assessment doesn't fully anticipate or take into account all that matters to patients. Um, as the report appropriately notes, AD is a multi-systemic multi disease that not only impacts patients, but impacts the communities in which they live, uh, their families, uh, their employers, um, virtually everyone that they touch in some way, shape, or form. It frequently occurs with other conditions. Um, it is unfortunate, uh, we feel, that uh, the cost-effectiveness study was not able to break out the costs associated with different co-occurring uh, uh, co conditions. But um, we recognize that that is just a shortcoming in the data. Uh, we also recognize that efforts are underway to address many of those, and we hope that in future studies, uh, ICER will um, be able to address those uh, with its model. We also encourage you to consider that um, the effectiveness of these drugs is not limited to, is not limited to a number, uh, either in a clinical effectiveness score or in terms of uh, the drug's um, cost effectiveness. Uh, Chris Averill, for example, we believe represents an important option for patients. Uh, it expands access in dimensions that previously um, wasn't available with the, with, with the drugs. These are the first new drugs that have been introduced uh, for, or have been approved, excuse me, for the treatment of AD in 16 years. Um, there have been limitations with uh, other drugs in terms of how long they can be used, uh, side effects uh, that they have on patients. Uh, we believe that this is um, an important option that should be, avail that should be available to, to uh, patients and to their providers. And um, as you consider this, 
we, as you've considered the questions, we hope that you'll take this into consideration. So finally, once again, to wrap this up, thank you very much uh, for being so proactive about including patients' concerns in uh, your process. Uh, we are happy to work with you in the future and hopefully um, we'll be able to help clear up some of the gray areas of, that, are, that are noted in your report. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Smith. Any um, comments from our ICER scientists? Um, I just speaking for me as well as for Sonia, search this on. Um, I wanted to thank the NEA and Tim Smith for the amount of time they spent with us, both getting us patients to speak with and multiple phone calls. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Anyone on the council, Eric? Yeah, can I ask uh, one question? Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your advocacy uh, for patients. I'm going to ask a direct question about uh, Chris Avarol. Um, which is in we have two small trials, or not small, or we have two trials um, that I'm looking at, and I'm looking at about a 10 percentage point difference in the effectiveness, kind of plus or minus, right, a little bit in terms of the percentage of patients that have a desirable effect. From a patient advocacy perspective, I mean, is that enough of, a, of an effect, you know, in order to sort of warrant some of the other, the other downsides? So, I mean, just put some, put this in perspective for me. Happily, uh, I think um, that it is, and the reason I think that it is, is because um, there's a lot that isn't known about Chris Averill or Chris Worrell. Um, again, I, there's a lot that isn't known. There, there was, it was not conclusive. Uh, what we know anecdotally is that for some, for some patients, it's a godsend. Um, it's, it's fantastic. It works for them. Um, there's less burning. It's a wonderful drug. Everything clears up and it's fantastic. For others, it's less effective. And I don't think that the data or the studies identify who it's going to work for better and who's going to work for not as much. So, Yes, I think it's an important option um, for providers, or I should say we think it's an important option for, for providers and for patients. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, so our last um, public commenter will be Susan Lipworth, uh, who is a patient. And Susan, please, we, we value the input, the CPAC values and, and pays a lot of attention to the input from patients and advocacy groups, so we really appreciate you being here. Hi, my name is Susan Lipworth, and I'm from Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. I've been asked by the National Eczema Association to speak with all of you about the impact that uncontrolled severe eczema has had on my quality of life. As with most chronic diseases, the person with the illness is not the only one affected. Eczema also affected my family members. I have lifelong asthma, allergies, and hay fever. Occasionally, occasionally, I would have small outbreaks of eczema behind my knees, ears, and elbows. The severe eczema appeared when I was pregnant with my daughter 22 years ago. It started gradually. However, by the eighth week of my pregnancy, it covered my entire body. The only places I did not have eczema were the palms of my hands and the soles of my feet. I constantly itched and scratched. I had chronic, itchy, scaly skin 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It never stopped. It went on like this for 20 years. During that time, I had many serious skin infections from the scratching, more hospitalizations than I can remember, and issues related to sleep and stress. I was so miserable, I was willing to try every treatment that my doctors could offer me. This included over-the-counter products for itchy and dry skin, bleach baths, wet wraps, photolight therapy, various expensive prescription ointments, potent medications, and Zolaire injections. I also tried alternative therapies, hypnosis, acupuncture, and various elim elimination diets. The trouble with all of these treatments was that they were minimally effective at best, and some of them had side effects. Sadly, there has been no long-term effective treatments available for me or others who suffered with this disease. It was tough to be me. My life center, centered around my skin. I had to be concerned about what type of fabrics I wore, the bath soap I used, and the detergent I washed my clothes in. I could not go to the gym. If I perspired, I would itch. 
If I went to the beach and got too much sun, my skin would flare. It was a vicious cycle. It was very exhausting and emotionally draining. Throughout this ordeal, I saw many allergists and dermatologists. Eventually, I was treated at Oregon Health Sciences, the National Jewish Hospital, and the Mayo Clinic. They all tried the various treatment protocols, but to no avail. The most important step I took for my survival with this disease was joining the National Eczema Associ Association, where I was on the board for 10 years. It was here where I met others like myself. They lived in my shoes. They all knew what it was like to live with uncontrolled severe eczema. I gained strength from these people, knowing that I was not going through this alone. Being actively involved also gave me a sense of control over my disease. 2013 was a very significant year for me. In June of that year, I contracted a sepsis bacterial blood infection. The bacteria entered my body through, um, through one of my skin lesions, exacer exacerbated by scratching. I was hospitalized for two weeks and, and went home with an antibiotic IV for two months. Later that summer, a group of eczema patients were invited to Sanofi Pharmaceutical. It was here where we met with employees associated with the development of a new medication to treat moderate to severe eczema. We also learned about the possibility of participating in the clinical trials for it. Based on what I heard, I came home and researched the possibility of participating. There was only one clinical trial site in the state of Michigan and it was 10 minutes from my house. I would have traveled hours to participate. I thought this was my only hope. I had fears about a not yet FDA approved drug being injected into me, but I was so desperate to alter the course of my life that was being dominated by my severe eczema. Fortunately, I was approved for the trial. After the initial loading dose, I noticed that the severe itching had stopped within 10 days. I was in the trial for three years, getting an injection once a week. Since I've been on the medication, I no longer have the dreaded itch. My skin has completely healed and is free from eczema. My allergist observed my life-changing improvement and said Dupixin was designed for me. I cannot imagine my life without Dupixin. There is a calmness and inner peace that I have not felt in 20 years. I am able to sleep through the night and have become a better mom. I have more patience. Also, I no, no longer need the medication that I was taking for anxiety. Without the Dupixin, the severe eczema will return. As a side benefit from the medication, I no longer need Advair, which I took daily for my asthma, which is $425 per month. And Dupixin has quite literally given my life back to me. I know biologics are expensive, however, this will pair in comparison to the hundreds of thousands of dollars that my insurance company has spent in the last 20 years. The inpatient and outpatient treatments, hospitalizations for numerous infections, medications that did not work, and for specialty doctor visits. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you. Um, but first, let me ask uh, David and Marita if they have any. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I suspect, first first of all, thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm. And we have other, other patients that are going to share their, their insights, too. And, and this is the critical part of what we do. Um, so we all appreciate this. Um, and I'm very happy to hear, as I'm sure everyone in this room is, that you're, you're doing much better. Um, yes. My question relates to um, loosely writ <clears throat> the communities that that you may be involved with, uh, virtual communities, and I'm particularly interested in knowing anecdotally now, without knowing knowing that this is scientific, about <clears throat> your own experience or others that you've communicated with who've had similar treatment regimens around side effects. I mean, you mentioned benefits. The experts on our side have certainly documented that, <clears throat> at least in the short run, there doesn't appear to be any. But, uh, you know, I mean, there, there are some, some minor. But, but um, have you, are you aware of any, anyone that suffered <clears throat> dramatically from the treatment? Uh, from the Dupixin? Yes. 
Not at all. Not at all. Are like, oh my God, I have to have this drug. Okay. And Use the mic if you don't mind. Well. Just, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. You know, I've been following a blog. I consider myself very fortunate that I had been able to participate participate in a trial. Mm -hmm. I am only one of four people in the initial trial that I was on. And it was just so dramatic for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, I, I, you know, I'm not one to give up, but I, for a while there, I thought there was no hope for me. Yeah. I had done everything. And, you know, I kept going to, you know, like National Jewish and the Mayo. I kept thinking that maybe one more doctor would have the answer, and mm -hmm. they didn't. I kept doing the same, you know, and these were out-of-pocket costs when I went to these, you know, other locations. And I could be the poster child yeah. for two pits. But, and but <laughs> my question is, and I think you've answered it, but yeah. just you're not hearing anything specific amongst no. the people you communicate with. You know, maybe, with. oh, you know, when they got the injection, mm -hmm. it hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, compared to my skin, you know, injections, you know, they sting maybe. Yeah. But I would take that over the etching that I had. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Um, Steve, do yeah. we want to talk about the, the agenda? Yeah, sure. So uh, thank you, everybody, for the public comments, for the discussion. We are a little bit ahead of schedule, as we'd hoped. So um, let's have a full hour for lunch, and we'll be back so that we can reconvene and start right at 1 o'clock. I also think that the voting um, will be probably quicker than allotted on the agenda so that we'll be able to start the policy roundtable a little bit soon, sooner than 2.15. But let's go ahead and take an hour for lunch, and we'll reconvene at 1 o'clock. Um, I know that those of you who are attending receive some information about options for lunch. Uh, clinical experts and patient uh, representatives are welcome to join the CPAC in the back room around the, the corner. All right. Nice job. Great. That was so good. The way you described it. I have a but the last one I saw was two years ago.